What I want to do in the next maybe 20 minutes, I would like to give you a short introduction into the center, also into the teaching concept that is uh, associated to it, uh, but also into the reasoning why we thought uh, that it may be a good idea to bring plant and animal breeding uh, together and why we were also able to establish uh, this structure here in, in the center, center here in Göttingen. And uh, first of all, breeding can be very simple and is very simple. Breeding basically always follows the same scheme. Uh, so we have a variety of biological objects, in this case tomatoes, so big ones, small ones, well-tasting ones, uh, not so well-tasting ones, Dutch ones or German ones. And uh, we select from this variety the ones that agree best uh, with our, what we call breeding goals, so that grow fast or grow big or uh, have a good taste or are especially uh, uh, healthy, whatever our breeding goal is. So then the next step, and I've deliberately chosen quite different species to, to visualize the different steps, is that we take the selected objects and mate them together. Uh, and then we produce a lot of offspring. And from these offspring, this is one breeding cycle, and these offspring are sort of the next generation we select from. And this works in plants, and this works in animals, this also works in, in bees and in fish. And basically, all breeding programs follow the same scheme. The, the only difference is that we have uh, sort of uh, technical uh, tricks or uh, sophisticated technologies, for example, to, pr to produce many more offspring or to do specific matings to produce just inbred individuals and so on. But basically, the scheme is always the same, and it's the same across plant and animal breeding. Animal and plant breeding sciences also go back to the same roots, or in, a, uh, in the genetics context, they are identical by descent. So it basically goes back to Darwin uh, with a, uh, his concept of evolution, which actually was quite, to some extent, ex uh, inspired by uh, breeding uh, activities he followed quite closely. He was an active uh, breed, uh, pigeon breeder, actually. Uh, Gregor Mendel discovered the laws of, of inheritance. Uh, and uh, this year, 100 years ago, uh, Ronald Fisher actually established the basics of, of quantitative gene genetics uh, in a paper that was published in exactly 100 years ago, and actually, initially, it was rejected by the uh, Royal uh, uh, Society, but still it uh, became uh, one of the most influential uh, scientific papers in the history of our, our science. Okay, so the fundamentals of our plant and animal breeding are the same, uh, and Actually, I found a citation that in 1903, so shortly after the rediscovery of, of Mendel's uh, laws, the American Breeders Association held its first meeting to discuss the new science of genetics for practical breeding of plants and animals. Uh, so it was one club in the beginning. But then, uh, over the next hundred years, uh, new technologies, new conceptual and biotechnological uh, innovations uh, uh, were developed. And I just list a couple of uh, important innovations on the conceptual side. We have, uh, for example, the concept of hybrid breeding or mark-assisted selection or genomic selection or the selection index to co combine different uh, uh, traits uh, to arrive at one selection decision. And we also have uh, technological uh, innovations uh, like uh, artificial insemination or embryo transfer on the uh, animal breeding side or the possibility to uh, induce mutations or produce double haploids on the uh, uh, plant breeding side. And most recently, the new technology of 
genome editing, which also is quite promising to uh, be a very useful breeding uh, technique, despite the fact that there may be some legal uh, problems to, uh, to overcome. But here, in, in this development, we see that some of the technologies and some of the concepts were, were almost completely or, 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 or to a, la a large extent uh, restricted to one of the domains. So, for example, induced mutations and double haploids basically were in plant science and embryo transfer and artificial insemination uh, were in animal science. And that sort of uh, caused the two fields to develop uh, not together anymore, but uh, in a way on, on separate paths and in a sort of a parallel fashion. And that created, and uh, it is very important to understand that uh, this difference is uh, to a large extent also due to biological reasons and technological reasons. Some technologies just cannot be done either in plant and animal breeding and therefore uh, the technologies cannot be used. So when we look at animal breeding today, we can say that, and plant breeding today, we can say that they are similar but uh, still in, in many cases different. And I just have listed a few uh, points which I think uh, they, they are important to, to see or to, to have in mind when, when we look at the differences. For example, the genome complexity is uh, much higher in many of the crops than it is in, in animals, which are mostly mammals, and mammals have a very boring genome in a way, compared to what, what these dynamic genomes we, we see in uh, some of the crops. Uh, animal breeders are simple-minded persons anyway. We are just interested in breeding values. We are not really using all this heterosis and, and uh, special, special combining ability stuff. That's too complicated for us. Uh, so we leave this field to the plant breeders. We also have no inbred lines available. We cannot produce them, at least not in, in, a, in a breeding context. We can do it with experimental animals. Uh, phenotypes for breeding in most livestock species come from the farm. So they are really fuzzy, we have a lot of environmental effects, we have a completely unbalanced structure, so we need statistical concepts to deal with that. While plant breeding can work with nice plant experiments, so the statistical, on the statistical side, the animal breeders are maybe a little bit more challenged. Genotype environment interaction adaptation, uh, again, is much more important in plant breeding. If the sun is shining heavily and the sheep is standing in the sun, the sheep just can walk to the shadow. If the plant stands in the sun, it has to stay there and survive the, the, the heat. Uh, so that's why adaptation is uh, much more important in plant breeding. Uh, transgenics is a big deal in, in plant breeding. So outside EU, uh, you know GMOs are widely used. Uh, in animals, there's just one example. There's one salmon that was recently uh, uh, made available in the, the, in the United States, which is actually transgenic for a growth uh, factor. Uh, and when it comes to ethical concerns, uh, we, have eth we have to deal with ethical concerns on both sides. In uh, plant breeding, it's mainly GMOs. In animal breeding, it's mainly animal welfare. But have breeding exercises been successful? Clearly, yes, in both fields. We have made enormous uh, genetic progress, both in animal and plant breeding, despite all these uh, differences. And there are many, there are many uh, structural differences within the field. So, uh, Chicken breeding and dairy cattle breeding is very much different. Potato breeding and uh, maize breeding is also very different. And probably chicken breeding and maize breeding are more similar than, uh, than maybe uh, maize breeding and potato breeding. So th there, there is a room for exchange and a, a room to collaborate and to learn from each other. 
I later will talk about uh, genomics and genomics brought us novel tools and concepts to understand the dynamics of population under selection and under adaptation. And that's one very good example where uh, we even can go beyond uh, plant and animal breeding and also uh, move to uh, breeding and, and the genetics and of forest trees and forest agriculture because there uh, the actual breeding is uh, at least in, in Germany of, of less importance but uh, understanding selection ad uh, and adaptation, natural selection and adaptation uh, plays a big role and that is obviously one uh, area where we can also collaborate uh, in this center. We also have to understand and see that breeding is a global business. I, uh, have, I show here a map uh, of uh, the global maize breeding. So all the green areas are basically areas where maize uh, is grown and, and uh, with uh, increasing yields which points to, to successful breeding. Uh, and here you see a, a chicken map basically showing the same thing and interestingly uh, showing the same thing in the same areas uh, of the world and uh, since the, the many companies are really uh, doing global business it, it is uh, obvious that we, are, we cannot just talk about the German or the European uh, situation but we also have to, uh, to keep an eye uh, on what's happening in all parts of the world. Now something we have faced over the last 10 to 15 years is what we call the genomic revolution, which was triggered by two developments. The one is uh, the available of high throughput genotyping and sequencing uh, technologies, which made it possible and affordable uh, to uh, really uh, understand and uh, dissect uh, the genetics of, of, of our crops and livestock species. Uh, and also suitable statistical concepts and breeding schemes that make use of this uh, new level of information. And that, that, this led to an increased efficiency of breeding programs. Genetic progress in dairy cattle has basically doubled due to the uh, using ge uh, genomic information. Uh, but also a platform to better understand the genetics of complex traits and the mechanisms underlying selection. And once you understand uh, what's going on, you can better work with it and, and improve it. And this gen genomic revolution turned out to be an opportunity to join forces again, I would say finally, because both animal and plant breeding had to enter completely new grounds. So both conceptually and Technologically, we really had to invent new things, new tools, new methods, and really uh, test them and, and, and get them not only in a, in a lab context, but also into, into in the industry uh, use. Uh, and obviously, it was uh, helpful to use synergies in developing uh, methods and tools, and also to uh, form a critical mass to manage the challenge was only possible by joining forces. And it was also helpful that some key players in the science on both sides were actually engaged in both fields, so people like Mike Goddard or Dan Gianola, Gustavo de los Campos and Bruce Walsh uh, uh, were certainly active with training, with collaborations, uh, both in plant and animal breeding. In Germany, uh, this concept of joint plant and animal breeding, or as we call it, synergistic plant and animal breeding, was established in a very successful research project called Synbreed, which ran from 2009 to 2015. It was BMBF funded. Uh, Chris Schön from the University of Munich was uh, coordinating uh, it, and I was sort of the coordinator on the animal side. And the nice thing about the Synbreed project was that it brought together both uh, plant and animal breeding, both on the academic and the industry side. So we had both industry and uh, academic partners from both areas. 
And that really turned out to be very successful. So we have implemented uh, genomic breeding concepts in quite a few species. We have developed high throughput uh, genotyping uh, facilities and uh, really laid the ground uh, to establish the technology. And we ended up with something like 100 scientific papers uh, that have uh, been published from that uh, collaboration. And that brought us to the idea to continue with the idea and uh, this basically uh, ended up uh, in being Synbreed, Cybreed, uh, uh, the Center for Integrated Breeding Research, uh, which basically follows the same structure. We have uh, also in integrated forestry, so forest genetics uh, on, the, on the academic side. But this was, uh, as President Beisiegel already said, this was only possible uh, because we had very strong uh, support from the industry. And I want to uh, name the five companies again that uh, provided uh, substantial support in uh, yeah, organizing this uh, collaboration and also sup provided substantial financial support for that. Uh, so that is the German Seed Alliance, KWS, uh, Strube Research, Lohmann Tierzucht and Böhm Nordkartoffel. I think representatives of all companies are here and thank you very much uh, for this great support. And this allowed us, uh, I talked about critical mass and, and I think the key thing is really to establish a critical mass. So we were able to uh, in, by direct uh, support uh, to establish uh, four additional professor positions or actually five where we of course use some uh, available infrastructure already. Uh, and you see here the uh, Jens Theten in functional breeding, Armin Schmidt in uh, breeding informatics uh, already joined the university in 2016 was a little bit more tricky and time consuming on the plant breeding side, but we, were, we are very happy that we uh, have now Tim Beisinger and Stefan Scholten who will uh, join the university in uh, the end of this year or next spring. Uh, and then it was already mentioned that uh, Niels Stein from the IPK Gattersleben has a joint appointment on uh, and professor position on uh, genomics of plant genetic resources. And uh, we also have uh, additional uh, new professors here in Göttingen, which are also strongly linked uh, to the center, which is in forestry, genetics, uh, and then science communication in, in life sciences. So Oliver Geiling and uh, Senior Post. Uh, and the later the letter will also uh, give one of the key lectures tomorrow the center is not only focused on on animal and plant breeding or agriculture and, and, and uh, forest science but we also have members from the faculty of business and economics the faculty of biology and psychology and the faculty of law and we also have links to uh, affiliated institutions like the Institute of Sugar Beet Research, uh, Beet Research Friedrich Löffler Institute, the Northwest German Forest Research Institute, Leibniz Institute of Plant Genetics and Crop Plant Research, EPK, and the German Primate Center. So you see we're not trying to be or we're not staying in this, in this little uh, breeding world but we also try to, to make links to uh, other neighboring uh, disciplines. So what are the challenges ahead that we have to deal with in the next, uh, let's say, 10 to 15 years? So a nice word about uh, what, uh, where agriculture has to go to is uh, sustainable intensification. So uh, we need increased productivity, we also need improved resource efficiency, but we also need a reduced impact on environment and animal welfare. So this is like the field of tension we have to, to deal with and we, we have to find solutions for. And for these solutions we 
have novel technologies, so mainly in the fields of genomics and biotechnology. And something which is coming up very strongly now is uh, the field of big data. Breeding was always a big data business, but now the others also find that big data is, is something cool. Uh, but what is really sort of new is, is this field of machine learning and uh, using new technologies to uh, exploit those uh, big data. But well, we should not forget that we still, the, the fundamentals are still the old technologies. So we still need a, a very good uh, command of selection theory of quantitative and population genetics and statistics and, and experimental design. Uh, and that is by far not, uh, these are by far not fields where nothing new is to be generated. There is still a lot of room for development uh, here. But uh, it's also very important that uh, breeding can o only be successful if society accepts what we are doing. So society needs to accept the necessity of breeding so that this breeding is a good thing to do in the first place. That the goals we want to achieve and also the technologies, the tools we use to achieve these goals and methods. Uh, so that is another challenge. And another major challenge is uh, to have the people, the next generation of breeders, that are able to do all that. So they have to have a thorough understanding of the breeding basics. Uh, they have to have specialized methodological skills. They should uh, show some interdisciplinarity. But remember, breeding is a global business. They also should uh, have social and intercultural competence and awareness. And this is sort of the other pillar of uh, the development uh, uh, we have seen here that was uh, that we, together with the center, we also in, introduced a master, a new master program of integrated plant and animal breeding called IPAP, uh, which exactly uh, follows uh, yeah, this scheme and has this uh, goal. And, and the, I, the, the idea of IPAP is that we have these core disciplines of plant and animal breeding, which are selection, selection theory and quantitative genetics, genetics also, and so on. But around this, there, there is a whole field of neighboring disciplines which come from economics or marketing. Uh, it's also mathematics, statistics, informatics, biology, nutrition, ecology, ethology and welfare, law, uh, animal and plant health, you name it. And, and so uh, all students take this court, have, take the courses in those core disciplines and then they can develop a profile. One is maybe more interested in the business side, the other is maybe more interested in the ecological side or adaptation side. So there, there is a room for uh, flexibility. But it's clearly, uh, clearly has a link to the industry through internships, through master programs uh, that are jointly uh, done with uh, industry research or also with public institutions, uh, research institutions. And we also integrate uh, quite a number of lecturers from the industry partners uh, where, which, uh, to uh, also establish quite early a link to, I would say, the real life of breeders and not only the academic life of breeders. So this is what we try to achieve and uh, actually the, the, uh, as we have it in our rules here, the university, the center was established when it was published in the, in the u official university newspaper, which was some time ago, but now it really starts living. Uh, the master program also we started with a sort of a pre-course two years ago, but now as a standalone master program, it starts this semester, so officially with the 1st of October, the master program is uh, implemented, and that's why we thought today is a very good, uh, or at this time, it's a very good uh, time to uh, 
have such a conference here uh, to yeah, celebrate the achievements. So this is a conference, Plants and Animals Bridging uh, the Gap in Breeding Research. Uh, you all have a program, so we will have uh, two more greetings and then Bruce Walsh will uh, give a, a first keynote lecture. Later we will have three scientific sessions. First on understanding and modifying genetic variability, then predicting complex genotypes and phenotypes and assessing and maintaining and using genetic diversity. We will always will have speakers from uh, different sites. Uh, and tomorrow uh, to the end, because we really think it's an important issue, breeding and society. We will have a panel discussion and Senja Poste, new professor of science communication, will also give a keynote lecture to, to start this discussion uh, on uh, yeah, why do public perception and scientific knowledge differ in, in the breeding context. So we are very happy uh, to all have you all here and uh, since we are happy we invite you for dinner. <laughs> so we will have conference dinner in the, in the restaurant Bulayan. Uh, so this is in the old town hall which is just a five minute walk from here. This is not the, how it looks uh, today, but it looked like a couple of hundred years ago, but the hole is still the same where you have to go in this door, uh, but there is a restaurant sign, so you will be able to, to find it. We start at uh, seven o'clock and we have a lot of time tonight to eat and drink and uh, talk. And with this, I would like again to thank our sponsors, not only for sponsoring the center, but also for sponsoring the dinner tonight. <laughs> so, thanks a lot. Uh, I don't read the name, names again, but it's, it's the same group of sponsors. Uh, and with this, I would, uh, I hope you enjoy the meal. Thank you.